Is that all right? Not hard. Yes. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Three, two. Coming up next on this week in computer hardware, AMD and Tress FX, because animating hair is hard. Are Samsung's new 840s slow? Don't buy a 27-inch 1080p monitor, PS4 rendering issues, and some perspective on the Chromebook Pixel. All that and more coming up next on Twitch. <laughs> Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twitch. Bandwidth for Twitch is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware, episode 207, recorded February 28th, 2013. Animating hair is hard. This episode of This Week in Computer Hardware is brought to you by Ting.com. Ting is a new mobile phone service that makes sense. Save money with Ting by paying for what you use. It doesn't require a contract and offers unlimited devices on one pooled plan. To save $25 on your first Ting device, visit twitch.ting.com. That's twitch.ting.com. And by Lantronics, maker of the X-Print server. Print from your iPad, iPhone, or any iOS device to virtually any printer. For more information, visit xprintserver.com slash twit and enter coupon code twit to receive free shipping on your order. Welcome to Twitch. This week in computer hardware, Twitch weekly show that aims to bring you the most important and exciting news in computer hardware. And of course, we talk about the tablets too, because they're taking over and maybe, maybe even the cell phone here and there. Joining me as always, Mr. I'm going to call you Mr. Frame Rating himself, Mr. Ryan Shroud, PCPro.com. How goes the land of new benchmark development? It's good. I was very worried when you paused for that long. I was not sure what you were going to actually call me. And when it started with an F, I was like, oh, man, we're going to have to start the show all over again. And it went to frame rating. I was like, oh, okay. No, we're comfortable now. I'm back. I'm, I'm back. I'm, I'm back in the flow. Uh, it's, it's going well. I'm, I'm doing well. It was busy. Uh, took a little break from sitting in front of a computer, staring at video games and crossbars and stuff like that. But uh, diving back in over the last couple of days as well. So good. So I mean, you know, frame rating. Nothing. Nothing. No new updates. No major changes. No. No new. Because I, I, you know, I, I've been kind of enjoying the the pace as we've slowly uncovered the world of frame rating and what it means in terms right. of. Un Covering the fails. Uh, primary, would, is it safe to say primarily on the AMD side of the benchmarking fence? Yeah, as it were? yeah, yes. Uh, for now, it is for sure. Um, I'm trying to remember exactly how much because I've I've had so many conversations about this stuff uh, since last week. I'm trying to remember how much we actually talked about it on Twitch. Um, the actual frame rating part of it. Did we go over the graphs and the and the zoom in of the data and that kind of stuff from I think an actual Titan review? Okay, I thought I thought we did too. Um, nothing has really changed in that in that regard. What has happened since last week is there have there has been kind of an explosion of feedback and comments and thoughts and criticisms and you know constructive criticisms and unconstructive Not so ones constructive you, criticisms. Right? Uh, but that's what you get when you do things on the internet. But right. you know, I've basically I've spent a lot of time reading thirty and forty page threads at different forums, including our own and others, and and trying to get you know what do people think about this? How are people reacting to these results? Uh, Scott over at Tech Report posted a reply, not really a reply, but kind of a, a a post that compared what his results were versus what results we were getting, and the dialogue is continuing, and I think. There is uh, a huge um, a groundswell of support for this type of thing. Still, nobody else has really taken a look at what we've been able, you know, they, didn't, they haven't been able to duplicate what we've been doing yet so far. But we haven't shown our full, we haven't shown all the other cards we want to show and all the other games that we want to show and that kind of stuff that, that are still uh, coming down the pipeline. And it's just a huge amount. I think I said on the podcast last night, we've generated about 10 terabytes of video wow. doing these captures thus far. Uh, I, I, should, I need to keep like a very specific metric on it because I think at the end of everything, it will be a really, it'll be, it'll be a cool stat to talk about how much data we had to gather and analyze in order to, to come up with these results that we have. Um, Exabytes. Yeah, it's one of those things where we, we, have, we have a Thunderbolt array that has SSDs in it and we have to have SSDs. So we can't use them for long-term storage. We got a one terabyte array right. 
of SSDs, but we have to uh, compress and move video off like every, basically every graphics card that we test takes about 700 gigs worth of, of data for, you know, mm -hmm. a handful of games at a handful of resolutions. So um, I think, I think overall good feedback from the community. I think people, uh, after I've been able to explain it a little bit more in depth over the last week about what we are doing and how we are doing, and I think people are, are responding pretty well. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think, I think AMD is responding pretty well. I had a conversation with them where, you know, the day after these results came out, they said, uh, we need to discuss this. Yes, we do. And, and, and they've, they've realized that there's a problem and they're trying to figure out what they can do to fix it and how long it's going to take and all that kind of stuff. So I, I think, I think all the things that I wanted to happen when this kind of data is released is starting to happen. Uh, cool. and then all that's left is for me to kind of fill in, the entirety of the rest of the story. I said last night as well on, on, <laughs> on our podcast that we, I have this outline in a Google doc that's, it is only an outline and I feel like it's already too long as it is because it's, we, we touch on so many different things on, on mm. what these results mean, what these screenshots mean. Um, you know, we try VSync on, VSync off. We have all these different adaptive and smooth VSync options to look at and compare between what AMD and NVIDIA are doing. And uh, when you get into two GPUs and three GPUs and even four GPUs, how everything changes, uh, it's, it's, it's going to be very complex. And I still think we're going to, yeah, I mean, you look at a graph like that, you know, immediately, this is not a, a three-paragraph story that's going to explain <laughs> what all those lines mean. Uh, and it's also a lot of it's also a lot of statistical work that I just have no. It's been so long that I, I'm I'm pulling out college textbooks out of our uh, <laughs> out of our uh, bookshelves, trying to relearn. What are the best ways to present this type of data when you've got 80,000 data points in a, in a single a single graph and a single image that, that Burke's showing up there on the screen, right? You're like, okay, now I need to really think about how, what all these mean. So uh, I'm, I'm hoping in the next couple of weeks we will have, I don't, I don't know if I keep saying that same timeline, but uh, two weeks or so is kind of a target in my mind for when we have a complete, a complete picture. I got to say, uh, when you start looking at the visual presentation of information, I highly recommend the books of uh, Edward Tufte, uh, who basically uh, is a college professor, lecturer. He's kind of beyond that. He's a guru is probably a comfortable word with this guy, but uh, edwardtufte.com. And he does these, the, the, the kind of seminal book is a visual display of quantitative information. And it can be a really interesting way to analyze how you present or basically analyze how we look at information and the, how you can pack more information to a given graph or map or, or subject. But uh, I'll check that out. interesting stuff there. Grounding things down a little bit. We've talked about revolutionary benchmarks. We've, we've talked about the, the visual interpretation of quantitative uh, Visual display of quantitative information. Uh, I can even say that maybe one more time if we're lucky. Water cooling. Corsair Hydro Series H90 and H1110, 140 millimeter liquid cooler. Um, Maury Teitelman wrote that up for PCPer.com. How are they holding up? Are, as, are, as Corsair sort of, ran, they, they've been ramping these up. This is like the yeah. probably, I feel like it's the fourth or fifth iteration we've seen in the last three years. How's the performance doing? Are they getting quieter? Are they getting more efficient at pulling uh, heat away from so your what's, CPU? So what's, what's interesting about the H90 and the H110 is that they are 140 millimeter radiators instead of 120 mm -hmm. millimeter radiators. So the H90 is a single 140 millimeter radiator. It's still, um, I'm trying to remember, I can't remember all the model numbers because they have released a ton of these at this point. Because you've got the single thickness and you've got the, the, the double thickness of radiators. These are single thickness about the about the thickness of a, of a single fan um, but these are 140 instead of 120 and then when you get to the h110 it's actually two 140s so it's a, a 280 millimeter radiator um, and what Corsair has done I don't know if this is if they plan on releasing other versions down the line or if this is some other strategy that they have but these these eschew any of the lights the, the Corsair link connections to, to, to USB ports with software to manage this stuff. These are, it's a pump, it's a, it's a CPU uh, uh, heat spreader, and it's a radiator, and it's a fan, and that's pretty much it. You're not, it's, I mean, it's kind of like the original releases of the H50 or whatever it was. Um, 
back to that, back to the basics in terms of fancy features and LED lights and all that kind of stuff. But performance wise, these are actually doing better than their 120 counterparts, which you would kind of expect. But I also mm -hmm. kind of had prepared myself for them to not really be much better because of because of something. I don't know. I was like, ah, okay, they're releasing 140. Why? Maybe they haven't done this since the beginning because there was no real difference between them. But if you go towards um, the second to last page of that review where he actually looks at uh, the temperatures and noise levels. So if you look at temps, the 110, H110 basically ties the SwiftTech Apogee HD, which was one of the best performing ones that we had seen so far at stock settings. Um, and then if you look at fan noise, the Corsair H90 was actually cooler than it, or it was actually quieter than any other of the units that we had seen so far. Uh, cool. And then if you scroll down a little bit further, you look at the overclock temperatures, the H110 is about three degrees Celsius cooler than the H90 and um, eight degrees cooler than the Corsair H80i, which is kind of the most recent mm -hmm. Corsair release uh, of the standard 120 millimeter versions of this. Obviously, the drawback to this is you have to make sure your case can support a 140 millimeter uh, right. radiator and fan or a 280 millimeter <laughs> top, right? And uh, Corsair has built their cases. And I, I, I don't think all of their cases do, but the majority of theirs will do 120s or 140s. And I think a lot of the newer cases will support 120s or 140s. Um, but uh, you should definitely double check that before before picking one of these up. Um, you don't want to get it and have to drill. You don't want to have to drill new holes in your case when you find <laughs> out that this isn't, isn't quite going to fit. The way so it's a little awkward. It. Yeah. Honey, where's the reciprocating <laughs> saw and the steel blades in the garage? Text so 100, 100, oh, sorry, $110 for uh, the H110, ironically, actually, uh, <laughs> and $80 for the H90. So nice. a little bit on the higher side, but if you take a look at some of the options that have the Corsair Link technology in them and lights on them and stuff like that, it's, they're not actually much more than what you would get in any other circumstance. Uh, and they're definitely right. performing a little bit better. So uh, I think I think they're, they're definitely good and definitely worth checking out. There you have it. Triple Monitor Gaming on a Budget is up on techspot.com. They had an interesting idea. They were like, you know what? We're, we're done. It's going to be a while for the next generation of cards come out. We're kind of running that at benchmarking to do. Um, but they kind of sat down and went, we haven't really taken a deep look at uh, triple monitor gaming, especially on a budget in a long time. So it's kind of funny, like with 2012 delivering the industry's first, uh, industry's first 28 nanometer GPUs for both AMD and NVIDIA, we enjoyed watching the bitter ritual of one-upmanship as the Titans scrambled to earn your cash. And uh, so they were kind of like, hey, why don't we look at resolutions up to 7680 by 1600? And it's really cool. If you go to the front page of uh, that article on uh, <coughs> techspot.com, uh, triple monitor gaming and if you scroll down uh you really start to get if you've never sat in front of a triple monitor machine um you really get an idea of how wide your field of view is now obviously you're going to be having the sort of black vertical lines of your monitors uh where your monitors yes. are popped next to each other so it, it looks a little more awesome right there than you're actually going to get in real life um but it's kind of funny. Instead of using a thousand dollar Titan or the the 980, uh, they decided to do a pair of HD 7850s, an HD 7970, uh, and then a, a 660 uh, Ti's and the uh, GTX 680 for the comparison. And I thought that was a really interesting setup um, because basically. You know, three uh, Dell 30-inch LCD flat panels that support 2560 by 1600, and they kind of get deep on it. I thought it was a really interesting article because they look at, like, you know, basically uh, max quality, 4X anti-aliasing, and there's some there's some pretty noticeable performance differences, stuff that you're probably not going to see or care about on a 1080p monitor. When you start going up to serious high-resolution gaming, um, you start to see some performance differences open up there. I thought it was an interesting read, uh, and it's really, really kind of compelling if you're looking at what the future of GPUs are, at least once you get into a high-resolution monitor, or if you're wondering if your current card has any hope of supporting... Uh, <laughs> three monitors while gaming with any grace three monitors while you're you know using an excel spreadsheet no problem mm -hmm. um 
but it was interesting. Uh, and I'm not, I'm going to, if you're curious, go over to techspot.com, read the article. I'm not going to, I'm not going to read the, the stunning conclusions, uh, but I will say it's an interesting read and, and well worth your time if you're thinking about multiple monitor gaming. So I still, I still need the thin bezel monitors. Like that's, <laughs> that's, that's the thing that's, that's still missing for me because those black lines can be pretty distracting at times. Right. Um, I, I need to maybe experiment with taking the bezels off of some of these displays and seeing how much uh, real estate you can actually remove from the monitors. If you're willing to break them and kind of void the warranty completely. <laughs> you're a purist. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It happens. We should uh, take a moment to thank one of our sponsors today. Uh, if you are in in need of less expensive uh, data plans for your modem, or maybe you looked around and realizing you're spending a car payment on cell phones every month or a mortgage payment if you have a large family, you should be taking a look at Ting.com. And we have a pretty good offer for you from Ting. Yeah, so if you've never heard of Ting before, um, they are a an MVNO, a reseller of the nationwide Sprint network. They don't have contracts. They don't have ETFs. And that's early termination fees. You're not signing anything up for a two-year deal or anything like that. Uh, it's truly and completely contract-free. Um, no bundling, no ride-along services. You can choose from what they call extra small through extra, extra large service levels for voice minutes, text messages, and megabytes per data. And the best part is it's all build separately. There's no overage. There's no penalties. If you use more than you thought you would, you just pay for what the next level up. You pay for what you use. Um, you're not going to get... It's so annoying when you have a plan that you pay for data at a certain cost per gigabyte and you go over that and all of a sudden that cost per gigabyte goes up somehow. It's, it's, it's very odd. Um, and if you don't use those services, if you use less than you thought you would, they actually drop you down to the next level um, and you can earn credits towards uh, your next bill. There's no add-on charges for voicemail, caller ID, tethering, hotspot, three-way calling, call forwarding, anything like that. No mysterious line items on your bill. <laughs> um, Ting charges for what you use plus whatever taxes they're legally required to collect. No hidden charges, recovery fees, or other BS, as they say. You can have an unlimited, unlimited number of devices on one plan. Um, uh, sharing a pool of minutes, data, uh, text messages, all that kind of stuff. Each device on a plan costs a flat $6 per month. So that's that's pretty nice as well. They have an online yeah. control panel. So you, you can take control of your account. You can see exactly where you're at. You can adjust your billing cycles, uh, your, your, your uh, billing plans as need be. There's what I think is interesting. They call the no hold customer support. So you call 855 one eight one eight five five ting ftw which is funny. Anytime between 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. Eastern, and a real person will apparently pick up the phone, which uh, is pretty damn impressive if you think about it. Yeah, they have great yes, online support. They have active customer forums, uh, easy help ticketing system, video tutorials, startup guides, a whole lot more. So here's how it works. You... Purchase your mobile device from Tang, which you'll receive in two to five business days. Then you activate your device with them, and you have the option to select a new phone number or to port an existing one. Finally, you select your monthly minutes, messages, and megabyte plans that you think will represent your usage patterns, and Tang will bill you at the beginning of your payment period, but you'll be charged or credited, credited in the following pay period based on what you actually use. So you don't have all this pressure up front of trying to figure out, ah, oh, do I need, am I going to get one gigabyte or do I, am I going to need two gigabytes? You know, some months it's different. Um, it's, it's actually really, really nice. So we encourage you to, to, to give this service a try, save money and better manage your mobile phone using Tang. Check out their savings calculator and see how much you or your company can save uh, and what's even better is Twitch viewers will save $25 on their first Ting device when you sign up. So the, the URL is, um, what do we have here? Twitch.ting.com. Or apparently, if I go back up to the top here, we also have Ting.com slash R slash Twitch will work <laughs> as well. So uh, they're obviously keeping up with the Joneses in that regard. So that's twitch.ting.com. That's probably the easier one to remember. Go there, check out their savings calculator, compare it to your bill that you have now, see what you know you would pay for minutes, text messages, data rates, that kind of stuff, and then use uh, that URL to save 25, 25 bucks off of your first device. Yeah, I, I, I dropped my cell phone modem. I, I bought 
with my own cash and modem from uh, from Ting, uh, and I dropped my cost fifty bucks a month. Impressive. <laughs> I like that. Yeah, it makes me happy. We should probably talk about what's going on in the wild and wonderful world of the GPU graphics market. Kind of a startling revelation. Uh, and I usually don't get real graphic. Gra I, I don't. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying not to make accidental puns here, but um, uh, if you've never heard the name, there's a, a pretty smart cat by the name of uh, uh, John Petty, who's the ultimate analyst of the kind of computer graphics market. He's been around forever. John Petty researches his company. And so it was really interesting. Um, there's normally kind of a huge uptick in sales uh, around uh, Q4 or was it Q3, Q4? Basically, sales go up around Christmas and then they drop. Uh, but quotes... Uh, uh, where did it go? Where did it go? Where did it go? Uh, Q4 2012 sales plummeted just short of 20% compared to Q3 2012. And did I completely read? There it is. The JPR found that AIB uh, shipments during Q4 behaved according to past years with regard to seasonality, but the drop was considerably more dramatic, uh, decreased 17.3% from the last quarter. The 10-year average is just 0.68% uh, year to year. They're down 10%. So if I'm reading this right, basically... GPU sales are way off, or am I completely reading this article wrong? No, that's that. That is what the article is saying. With Q4 sales plummeted, just short of twenty percent compared to Q3. That's that's mm -hmm. that's about double what is kind of expected in that um, traditional drop off period. Um, and it, it's interesting. So uh, obviously, what people are are claiming this drop off is you're not selling. 20% fewer computers, 20% fewer laptops, what's happening is, is those Intel integrated graphics and the Ivy Bridge processors mm -hmm. are enough for basic computing purposes. So less and less people need to buy discrete graphics solutions. Uh, and that definitely seems to be the case. Um, and and what, what is probably happening is you're seeing these, these gaps um, with these differences largely in the low price GPU markets, right? So let's say the, the $50 and less, maybe $100 and under GPU section that you would, you know, typically find it like even at your Best Buy or Circuit Cities when they existed and that kind of stuff, that would be the most basic upgrades for integrated graphics. Those are less and less useful. And they were also uh, not the most profitable, but the largest in terms of unit sales, obviously, for companies like NVIDIA and AMD. Right. So, I think that's where it's coming from. I would like to see more information on um, what the sales differences are, maybe what the profit differences are. I think that's going to take a little bit longer to get that information from uh, from everybody involved. Uh, but the uh, because as we, as we kind of talked about earlier, I th I think that the PC gaming is actually going through a resurgence. We've seen more and more people who once were dedicated console gamers exclusively. Uh, getting back into PC games because they're seeing what the graphical differences are, the fact that you can use um, the Steam big picture mode, the fact that you can use an Xbox controller if that's what you're comfortable with uh, and still play and you can play on your TV fairly easy and all that kind of stuff um, that, you, that we've actually seen. My, my guess is we'll have seen the mainstream um, and above sales of graphics cards increase relative to that that standard seasonal decrease, right? Whereas on the low end, it's obviously gone the other direction. So it's it's bad news for the GPU vendors, obviously. Uh, they they don't want to, you know, NVIDIA's market share is increasing, but it's increasing in a shrinking market, according to this report. So if, if a rising tide floats all boats, then I guess the lowering one sinks them all eventually. I bet who knows at this point. I, I, I don't think it's quite as dire as... Maybe the numbers make it look here uh, at, for this particular quarter. You don't think? I do not think. I do not think. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, Unreal Engine 4 on PS4 has reduced quality. I thought this was an interesting uh, write-up. Uh, uh, basically, one of the big things present at the PlayStation 4 press conference last week, uh, Epic's Unreal Engine 4. Um, Epic's always toting this around that the con, you know, <laughs> quote has been present at several keynotes and new console launches. Uh, right, Scott Michaud over at Michaud or Michaud? Good. Michaud? Michaud. 
Yeah. Okay, just want to check that. Uh, uh, last generation Unreal Engine uh, 3 kicked off both Xbox 360 and PS3 with Gears of War and Unreal Tournament 2007. Uh, this is a continuation of the Elemental demo uh, that was first seen at uh, E3 last June. And uh, all Scott could think was, quote, this looks pretty bad. What happened? Um, so there's YouTube videos you can go if you want to kind of like follow along at home is the way he put it. Um, and... You know, you should also, when you, if you go up and read this up at PC Per, click on the pages because things start to get a little more crisper and clearer when you have the full size uh, stills. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, he's basically saying the, the lighting, um, contrast, some of the issues. I mean, what's, what are we seeing here? I mean, is it things gone that sideways on, on development? No, I think what, what, what Scott is trying to point out is that as much hyperbole as there is about the performance and power of the PlayStation 4, and it is right. obviously a big jump over the current generation consoles that uh, are you know six and seven years old at this point, that uh, the people claiming that, oh, look-see, overpowered PCs are useless now. There's no difference between <laughs> what you can do on that and a PS4. Um, and... What's interesting is with the console, you will be able to get better graphics out of simil similarly specced hardware on a console than you would on a PC because you have mm -hmm. uh, the developers know exactly what hardware they're targeting towards. They can tweak every last you know cycle out of the GPU and out of the CPU that you can't really do on a on a on a standard PC platform where there's a lot of varying hardware that you have to worry about. Um, but it, it looks like the 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 current consoles, the new consoles that are coming out this year, will not have as big advan as big of an advantage graphically and performance wise over the mainstream PC as they did uh, uh, at the last cycle, right? So that that this this article basically says, okay, here is um, the the shots of the exact same demo running almost a year later, nine months later on newer, mm -hmm. quote, newer hardware, but there are definitely some differences that show that the PC version still has a higher total quality level. You look at the particle counts, you look at the particle effects, um, you look at some of the things, yeah, I mean, you definitely need to zoom in on uh, the full shots that uh, that are linked in the in the story as well. I mean, look at the at the at the guy's eyes and see what 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 happens and what's not happening and 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 you can definitely tell there are some differences. It's possible that it's all artistic differences. Mm -hmm. It's also possible that it's technical limitations and technical differences that we're seeing um, that that are still pointing in the direction of hey a single I think that was that demo was running a single GTX 680. Right. Um, that was the big deal at the time uh, at E3. It was okay. Look, this is still that much better than what you're going to get out of a PlayStation 4. So don't don't jump to the conclusions <laughs> that the PC is now, you know, uh, the $600 PC, the $700 PC is now going to be completely outgunned uh, by the PS4 and the next Xbox. Um, and that mm -hmm. may not be the case. May not be the case. And we should also point out that the the, the PlayStation 4 is A, far from done, far from shipping, uh, True. and far from over at this point. But... It's going to be interesting to watch as that rolls out. Uh, AMD and Crystal Dynamics use Tress FX to bring GPU compute to hair simulation. Uh, so you were joking about, like, why is AMD pushing uh, hair care products? And uh, this was yeah. the result. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was odd. Kind of so last, I guess, a couple of months ago, AMD, when they first launched this new um, uh, marketing campaign with all these game pack-ins and bundles they were doing, they had a slide on tomb, the new Tomb Raider, and it said, a new secret unreleased DirectX 11 feature. And we were all like, I have no idea what you're talking about. There's no secret DX11 features. This, is, this turns out this is what they're talking about. Um, and the quote here is, it's called Tress FX. Obviously, mm -hmm. a, a play on something like Tresemme hair products um, that they, they are revolutionizing Lara Croft's hair by using direct compute programming language to unlock massively parallel processing capabilities of the GCN architecture, enabling image quality previously restricted to pre rendered images. Um, they're using order independent transparency and per pixel linked list data structures to manage rendering complexity and memory usage. Um, a lot of words that basically means you're going to have hair that looks a lot better. If you look at that second <laughs> image in the story where they show standard hair versus Tress FX, yeah, um, there there is a difference 
that that you can see there. Yeah, that that picture kind of shows it a little bit more a little bit more detailed. Um, what worries me is we haven't yet seen video of this yet. I've gotten a bunch of screenshots, a bunch of stills, but no video of what these comparisons are. The game comes out on Tuesday, so we don't have very long to wait. It comes out on March 5th. Um, but I mean, they're using real-time physics simulations. Uh, the physics system treats each strand of hair as a chain with dozens of links, permitting forces like gravity, wind, and movement of the head uh, to move and curl her hair in a realistic fashion. Collision detection is performed. Uh, there's a whole lot of stuff there. And as I did confirm last night, this is not an, a restricted to AMD hardware. Apparently, this will also run on NVIDIA hardware at some performance level that I don't, you know, we'll have to see what it actually turns out to be. Um, Interesting. But it's one of those things that's been shown in... Anytime a new GPU would launch, you would see these demos about, here's, look what our GPU can do. And, and these are, you know, NVIDIA or AMD built demos that show a, a wolf man with rendered hair or something like that. When Tessellation was first being released in 2010, they were talking about, here's what we can do with hair. And they had these really impressive demos, but you never really saw it implemented in real time in a game. So this is, uh, this will be interesting to see. And, and, because it is a third-person game, because it is a game mm -hmm. where you're always looking at the back of this character's head, more or less, <laughs> the hair is there all of the time. So you will definitely, I think, be able to notice uh, the difference with it on and off. So uh, we're going to do, we're actually doing uh, a live stream on Tuesday at 8 p.m. Eastern mm -hmm. on Tomb Raider. And I'm sure we will show before and after. We'll we'll do some we'll do some uh, examples and and that kind of stuff of what it looks like with and without uh, without the Tress FX feature, <laughs> as it's called. So uh, it, it's I, cool I stuff, see. right? It's it seems so minor. What's this character's hair look like? But it's it's one of those things that's always been really really hard to do. And mm -hmm. is it possible that we now have the capability to do that with a GPU horsepower? Um, that we all have or that a lot of us have inside our PCs. This, this is something we've talked about uh, on, on back on HD Nation, and, and uh, it's, it's really cool. If you want to see something funny, do, do a search for Pixar hair and rendering. Uh, you know, and it, it's been one of the things about uh, animation, right? Which is, you know, okay, it's not real time, but some of the most incredible advances uh, uh, in 3D have been basically made so you could make uh, rendered characters' hair more realistic. Sully, yep. the, 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 the character for Monsters, Inc., was, was a revelation. Uh, but there's some amazing uh, reading you can do behind, uh, you know, graphics.pixar.com slash library slash hair slash paper dot PDF, volumetric methods for simulation and rendering of hair. Uh, io9 has got a really good uh, article called The Physics of Pixar's Hair that came out after Brave. And it's really funny. It's like, what do a human hair, a steel pipeline, and an amoebas flagella have in common? Once they all assume the right proportions, they all work the same. A miles-long oil pipeline, though it can be massively thick when looked at up close, looks like a long, spindly hair when it's spread across the landscape. Um, it's really, really interesting. Uh, you know, it's something, it's a problem that applies over in Emeryville at Pixar. It's a problem that applies at MIT. It's a problem that applies when you're actually looking at really massive projects like pipelines. It's just, it's, you can get some serious nerding on. If, if you're looking for, for a rat hole to fall down and get in some serious <laughs> mathematics, uh, that is an interesting direction to go. Uh, another interesting direction to go. I thought it was a pretty cool article. Um, the uh, crew over at Hard OCP took a look at the uh, 840, the less expensive cousin of the 840 Pro, uh, and it's interesting. Um, quote, uh, the 840 series SSD features the powerful 8-channel MBX controller and TLC NAND. While this value SSD comes at a very good price, it also features much lower speeds than its larger capacity brethren. We we'll put the value SSD through our suite of steady state tests to see if it can pass muster. Um, and it's it's interesting thing like you know it's it sounds kind of silly but uh, different memory choices are going to impact the performance of your card. Um, they started out with like everybody else with the 840 Pro. There's been a whole slew of 840s in different sizes. Um, so I, I will I will just say it seems that we were right to withhold the silver status from the 120 gigabyte TLC product when awarding the 250 and 500 gigabyte versions with high marks. So this may be, if you're thinking about this particular drive, I suggest you uh, head over to Hard, Hard OCP and read the article. Um, I thought it was, you know, we, we could also point out that any SSD, no matter how slow, uh, should still uh, uh, just change your life compared to a traditional rotating media hard drive. Um, 
But it's interesting that even brands we trust can have products that perform radically differently depending on uh, which version it is and what memory choices and controller choices that the vendor makes. So definitely an interesting one to look at. Uh, and MLC, if you're looking for all the performances, uh, is still the way to go. So do we have a minute for like one more crazy uh, storage story? Sure. <laughs> Um, this is up on PC Per. Tim Very wrote this up. Uh, Facebook implementing cold storage media archive in new data center. So it's really funny. One of the reasons we keep seeing uh, in the enterprise side of the market, power has been a big story for years and years. And the reason power is a big story, or more importantly, the reduction of power consumption is because the more... Uh, the more watts, the more electricity your servers uh, and drives consume, the more expensive it is to operate a data facility. And it might not be a big deal if you have a couple of racks uh, in a colo location for your small business. But if you're Google or Yahoo or Amazon or somebody that has literally acres and acres and acres of PCs under a single roof, uh, you know, I mean, Google's basically locating uh, their data facilities based on the, you know, the amount of electricity they can get. So they're like going next to, uh, um, you know, hydroelectric facilities and stuff. It's kind of a, a wild concept. So, What's what's interesting is is it's, it's expensive to store data when you get into really serious amounts. Uh, there's a basically a, a property up in Prime View, Oregon, that Facebook is building a massive data center that quote will house servers with up to three exabytes of total data capacity. So if you're wondering what an exabyte is, uh, terabytes, I'm sure we're all familiar. Uh, you add several <laughs> multiplications on that, you get to petabyte, and you go even bigger than that, and you get to an exabyte. So I'm trying to think like three exabytes. Let's see, convert three exabytes. You know, typing is usually something I can do <laughs> to terabytes, and this should be a ridiculous number. Here we go. That is uh, 3,145,728 terabytes of data. <laughs> That's so enough. that's enough. So the idea yeah. is that basically media that nobody's really looking at that Facebook has to store because it's linked on your Facebook page, they're going to back that up to the Prineville, Oregon facility. Um, and that way they, they don't waste uh, sort of prime server space and uh, they save a lot of electricity. So, quote, uh, the company claims that its users upload 350 million photos each day. That's up to Facebook. But that 82% of the social networking site's traffic focuses on a mere 8% of the available photos. For example, a demotivational problem. poster, uh, you know. A picture, you know, let's say of a dress failure after a major sports event or whatever horrible <laughs> thing that's showing up being passed around multiple times in Facebook. So right. the idea is that they can, you know, uh, that they can take this, this, the, the, the eighty-two percent that or the ninety-two percent that is rarely looked at and offload it to another facility is kind of fascinating. What's really ridiculous, um, quote, considering Facebook's existing Prime View data center used a whopping seventy-one million kilowatts of power in the first nine months uh, moving to a new store cold storage system for infrequently accessed files is an excellent idea so in theory you know you might be like a a, a, a small delay when you're launching that cat video from several years ago um, <laughs> but I just thought that was uh, pretty crazy it's, you know because the servers basically are going to be in a, a low power a sleep state um, mm. but uh, I think it's going to be yeah as much as a couple seconds so I think I think you'll probably be able to live with it, but uh, uh, apparently Facebook's bottom line can't live without it. Either that or their electric bill uh, is just so prohibitive they decided well, it was time <laughs> to embrace that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Expert Server Back is a sponsor this week on Twitch. You are a big fan of the Expert Server. You want to tell folks what this magic little box does, right? Absolutely. So the Xprint server um, is a, a device that allows you to print easily from your iPhone, your iPad, I, iPod Touch, any of those kinds of devices. If your printer isn't AirPrint compatible already, you probably have this headache where you're downloading an application um, in order to print something out that you found on your phone or on your iPad, or maybe you're emailing yourself a link to a web page and then you're going to your computer and then you're going to print it that way. Um, if you use the XPrint server, 
then uh, this, which, is, which is from a company called Lantronix, you don't have to worry about that problem anymore. Um, the X-Print server enables wireless printing from your iPad, iPhone, iPod Touch. It eliminates the need to print through those apps, install any software, email yourself documents, and it works with the USB or network printer that you already own, whether it's wired or wireless. So you print directly from the iOS native menu. There's no apps or any software to load or anything like that. It supports more than 4,000 top brand network printers. It's easy to use. It has automatic discovery and setup, which is actually not an understatement. You literally plug in power. You plug in the network cable. If it's a if it's a networked printer, you're done. If it's a USB printer, you then plug the USB printer into the Lantronix uh, device right there, the Lantronix X-Print server, and you wait maybe 30 seconds. The light on the top will stop blinking, means it, meaning it's found all the printers on your network, and you can show, look on your device, and you can print directly to them. And we did that here at the office, and it was literally, it was literally that, that simple. Just open it, plug it in, and print. If you want more advanced configurations options, you can do that through a web interface. One X Print server supports multiple printers and virtually unlimited iOS devices. The Home Edition's 99 bucks supports up to eight USB and two network printers, and the Network Edition is $149 and supports unlimited network printers. It's great for your home or the office, and it allows your USB printers that you already own to be shared with all users over the network. So it kind of acts as a USB network print server as well. Uh, and it will work with those large multifunction beast printers too. So uh, here's what you need to do. Go to xprintserver.com slash twit for more information and to find out how you can buy one of these. And we've got a special offer for you. If you use coupon code twit, <laughs> you'll receive free shipping on your order. So you can go there, go to the website, xprintserver.com slash twit, learn about the device, see the demos, check for compatibility with your printer. Like I said, 4,000 plus devices, yours is going to be on that list. And I think they even say that if yours isn't on that list, if you email them and let them know, they might be able to just add support for it. Um, so go to xprintserver.com slash twit, twit. Use that coupon code twit when you check out and you can get free shipping on your order. So we thank uh, Lantronix for their support of This Week in Computer Hardware. Thank you, Lantronix. So Twitch, T-W-I-C-H at twit.tv is the email address if you want to track down us. If you want to send us an email, you got a question. And this is the part of the show where we embrace and love and nurture each and every question we can fit into the show. Uh, Bruce has an interesting question about cooling a laptop. He says, I'm using a free Windows program and a laptop cooler. I'm able to lower some of the internal component temperatures of my laptop. My goal is to reduce wear and tear on the components. My question Am I really accomplishing anything besides minimizing the chance of getting third-degree burns? To me, these are just numbers. Thanks for your time, Bruce. And uh, you are pretty much chasing numbers. Cool. Keeping your lap from burning is always a plus. Although I find sure. that you know, uh, you know, if 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 your laptop runs that hot, like my my number one thing for reducing laptop temperature was putting a flash blocker in place uh, on my browser. And once I shut down Flash and it didn't automatically start, because I tend to have like thirty two thousand windows open simultaneously, uh, <laughs> you know, I could go from raging, screaming fan of doom coming out of my my laptop to a relatively manageable noise of any noise at all um you know it, reducing temperatures is good but the reality is 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 being dropped down a flight of stairs uh having somebody spill a beer into it being dropped down a flight of stairs um a massive power surge all these things are much more likely to kill your laptop than heat at least right. at the high end of the laptop market whether you're talking about, you know, Dell or HP or, um, you know, one of the one of the boutique vendors or the Apple products, because um, the, the thing is, is there's not really is there wear and tear on resistors and capacitors and the transistors inside of your chips as they heat? Well, no. For all intents and purposes, I mean, you know, clean power is usually much more important to the survival True. of your electronics than, you know, at, at least if you are within the sort of the intended thermal envelope of your product. And Intel should not have let any notebook or AMD, for that matter, should not let any notebook ship that doesn't adequately cool the parts inside. It becomes, I think, more of an issue uh, the more off brand you get for your for your laptop or, or notebook. I mean, yeah. No, you know. I, I agree. I don't. There, nah. I, I'm not super worried about it cooling down the laptop. 
I, I may be yeah. worried about if you can make it less noisy with that's that cool. application. That might be interesting, right? Maybe well, it's something that controls. I'm guessing what it's doing is it's limiting uh, the processor speed and that kind of stuff. Yeah. I mean, my biggest issue is, is I have had at least one laptop where it was physically painful to have it, like if I was wearing shorts. Uh, and I live in California, so I wear shorts nine months out of the year because I can roll that way. Um, but, you know, uh, that to me is a big, you know, in that case, I usually either put it on a desk or use one of the soft kind of laptop coolers where it's a, there's a whole bunch of different engineered t devices that are designed to keep hot laptops uh, off your lap uh, with, and, and actually, you know, allow them some more cooling air. Um, right. But yeah, I mean, they're just numbers. You know, if you were, if you were sort of, you know, if you were benchmarking, uh, you know, if you were sort of a benchmarking geek or you were going for overclocking mayhem and trying to set some new records, the numbers might be more meaningful. But the reality is you're basically, you know, if, if throttling these numbers down and not, you know, being able to cook an egg on the underside of your laptop makes you happy, go for it. Uh, are you expecting to get another year out of the life of your laptop as a result? No, um, I just got handed a stack of laptops to 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 play around with for, for some projects, and there's nothing wrong with them except that they're six years old, and they cap out at like four gigabytes of memory, and they've got Core Two Duo processors that were smoking fast in 2007 or 2006, and you know, <laughs> and they just don't seem as awesome with the, you know, the latest operating system and and the latest yeah. versions of the applications that we're running, and that's that's more of an issue with. Um, uh, the fact that I, you know, does code get sloppier? Does code get bigger? Do we expect more things out of our applications? Uh, mostly, I think we expect more things out of our applications over time. I mean, web browsers used to be pretty light, uh, <laughs> and now they take up. You get a hundred windows, a hundred tabs open, and all of a sudden you'd be consuming a, a gigantic chunk of resources inside your computer. Gotcha. So. I think I waxed a little too long on that one. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Thomas is wondering about a power supply upgrade for a new GPU. He says, thanks for a great show and for keeping me painfully informed as to how out of date my system is becoming. Don't sweat it, dude. We've all been there. So after watching the PC per crisis three stream and watching my Radeon 4850 crawl into the corner and hide, I was probably <laughs> weeping at the time. I've decided I need want to upgrade. I'm looking at a 7950 or even a 7970, but I'm concerned my power supply might be an issue. I've currently got a 600 watt supply from 2000, eight uh, wattage meter on my supply uh, input and I idle at 215 watts and peak at around 405 watts. Uh, that's with Prime 95 and Future Mark both running. I know that's my system power plus the supply and efficiency combined, but I figure that gives me a safety margin. Can I safely handle a 7950 or even a 7970 without pushing the limits? I don't like the idea of running my power supply at 100%, but I see many of the cards list a 500 watt supply as the minimum, which probably is assuming an average system and I do have an overclocking tendency or i do have overclocking tendencies what do you both think so um, that 500 watt i just checked the hd 7970 does recommend a 500 watt it says 500 watt or greater power supply uh with one eight pin pci express power connector of uh that will support 150 watts um which is what it does so eight pin is 150 six pin 75 um if he has a 600 watt power supply i i i think he's gonna be just fine actually i'm sorry i was just yeah. looking for that uh that link that i had in here that new egg link because he posted which the exact power supply that he had and i think it was a a little bit older pc power or occ yeah. stealth extreme 600 watt unit um it's not overpowered by any stretch I think he'll be able to fit in line there with that power supply um mm. although you know, the, the, I guess the issue is you're not, if it doesn't work, I think the worst thing that will happen is you'll have some instability. You right. won't fry your system or anything like that. <laughs> it will just, your system will maybe lock up or crash or something like that because of it. And then, then maybe you can go into uh, looking at upgrading that power supply if you need to. I have, I, I would think if you're not running, you know, six hard drives that spin up all at the same time, if you're not 
um, powering a lot of other accessory devices. You're talking about a processor, one or two hard drives, a graphics card, maybe a sound card or something like that. I think your 600-watt unit will probably be fine. If AMD mm -hmm. and NVIDIA are recommending 500 watts for their 7970s or GTX 680s, you know, they're always erring a little bit on the side of caution. And then you have a 600-watt power supply, again, giving you a little bit more headroom to account for any kind of, um, you know, inaccuracies and in what the power supply can handle versus what the graphics card is asking for and that kind of stuff. So I, I would think that, I would think that he'd probably be pretty good with that. And, you know, uh, last week's episode, we gave you a bunch of uh, power supply ideas if you want to update, mm -hmm. although it's supposed to be an 80% efficient power supply that you have already, so you should, you should be in good shape. But... If you're looking for a little extra to spend for a hundred bucks, you can get a pretty badass power supply to go along with your new GPU if you're feeling paranoid. Yep. But uh, we had a quick thought from George about the Chromebook Pixel. He says, "Great show. Keep up the excellent work." A comment on thank you. A comment on the Google Pixel from an old guy, 63, and Chromebook owner who worked in semiconductors. In the old days, the hardware came first and the software followed. I suspect that Google has some big software plans for this new hardware. So. It's an interesting thought that maybe we're going to see something particularly badass coming from Google or some of their software manufacturers. So we have just about run out of time. Do we have time for one more question or do we need to? Uh, need if, to yeah, if, you, if we do, if you do, then I do. Let's go. We can do that. Uh, let's see. Should we talk about picking a 27-inch monitor or mini ITX and memory? Let's do, uh, we'll do the mini ITX one next week. Let's go ahead and talk. Uh, let's answer Kevin's email about the 27 inch display. Kevin says, I'd like to upgrade to a 27 inch monitor. Me too. And the question is, should I go with a 1080p or 2556 by 1440 display for movie watching and gaming? There's more question here, but I'm going to say this right now. I would not upgrade to a 27 inch monitor right now uh, unless it was 2556 by 1440. And this is somebody who's effectively using a 27 inch 1080p monitor right now. Now, here's where it gets interesting. Kevin says the goal would be to spend between $300 and $400 for a display. So if I jumped up to a 2556 by 1440, I would have to go with an eBay Korean display or maybe try the new displays that Monoprice is starting to sell. This is not a problem. Everybody we know so far that's got the Korean monitors and Monoprice is essentially rebranding those Korean monitors mm -hmm. is happy. Um, mm -hmm. He says, I don't have an SLI set up, but I have no current plans to upgrade to one in the near future. Uh, and he's running a uh, Core i5-2500K and a Radeon HD 7870GHz edition with 2 gigabytes of RAM. Do you see any, you know, major issues with trying to pump pixels uh, off of the 7870, Ryan? So actually, I think, uh, Patrick, you and I have the same kind of tendencies in this regard where <laughs> the monitor is one of those things that gets upgraded the least often but it's probably the most important because you know you right. you, you hear the the sentiment that hey uh, keyboard and mouse those, that's what you're actually touching right so that's that's important for your computing experience the monitor is what you're looking at it's the last thing between <laughs> all that computing power in that box down there and what's actually right. hitting your eyes. So I agree with you. I would go with a 2560 by 1440 monitor. I would spend a little bit more money if you had to because this is something you'll probably keep for several generations Years. of computer. Um, and the Korean monitors, we've had several of them here. Uh, Ken, is, Ken uses one and he hasn't had any issues with it. We've had lots of reports, as you said, of people using these without without problems. You know, The, the only issue that I have with the Korean displays is that as they have become more popular, people on mm -hmm. that are selling them on eBay have realized that, and sometimes the prices are a little <laughs> bit higher than they were when we first found them. So keep an eye out for that. Make sure right. you're not, you know, you're getting the same kind of deal that you should be getting. Um, but I, I think, you know, even if even if the 7870 isn't going to be able to push 25 by 14 at the quality settings that you want today, you know, you can look at multi GPU stuff. You can, like I said, you're going to keep that monitor for multiple generations. Maybe you're going to you're going to get an 8,000 series card or a GTX 700 series card or whatever it is that comes out in 2013 or 2014. And you still have that display to enjoy the image quality on, right? Regardless mm -hmm. of what happens on the rest of your, of rest of your hardware. So, um, yeah. the, the rest, you know, 7870 is going to be good enough to run a lot of games <laughs> that res and, and maybe not all of them. Uh, so you'll, you'll have to but pick and choose there. But I think the idea of getting a 1080p, 27-inch monitor is over at this point. Yeah. Um, I, I really wish that these three to four hundred dollar 
Korean displays were purchasable someplace other than eBay. I think people would be way more comfortable if that were the case. And I would be way well, more mono, comfortable. Let me, let me see if they're back in stock on, on monoprice.com because we've seen them kind of come, uh, come I haven't in seen and out them, stock I, haven't, there. I never actually saw them in stock. If they are, awesome. Because, you know, they have good customer <laughs> support, good return policies. If there's any issues, you know, you do that. And it's always, you always feel better ordering not from somebody who's shipping a monitor directly to your door from <laughs> Korea. Right. There's just always a potential for headache and that kind of stuff. So, uh, but I, I think this is what this is what the PC gaming needs. You know, you 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 want these super high res displays. You want to show why you know you have the compute power that you do and, and a 1080p display. I mean, 1080p on TVs has been around for what is it, 15 years now? Are we up to that yeah. point? Something Give like or take. That. <laughs> 15 years, and we haven't seen any increases. Here's your chance to get that increase that people who are playing on consoles and on older displays aren't going to have. So, right. yeah, I, mean, I think maybe we talked too long about that, too. Go go for the higher res display. Well, we're honest about it. So, yeah, you know, now it's funny. I, I did a search for LCD on, uh, on Monoprice, and I got one 17-inch monitor, so... Hmm. I, I had a feeling that they were there was something happening in the background that they weren't getting the monitor. So here it is, um, 27 inch IPS display, uh, estimated arrival time March 15th. Oh, okay, there's a back order, and I but I think I don't think it's ever been in stock yet. Maybe really? it has, and I haven't paying attention, but I don't I don't I don't think it's actually been in stock yet. The starting price is three ninety <laughs> three hundred ninety dollars and sixty cents. Not so bad. that would stay under the four hundred dollar price range. Um, who knows how many they're getting in and for how long? So we'll see. <laughs> Keep Wonder what the cat leaps are going for on eBay. You know what? If you're curious what a cat leap twenty seven inch uh, Yamasaki monitor, uh, the WQHD monitors are running for on eBay. I'm going to let you search on your own. We're actually running out of time. Uh, what's coming up on uh, on PC Per this week, Ryan? Um. I told I completely didn't look at the schedule for this week. We have reviews <laughs> coming up. We have reviews. Oh, we have our Tomb Raider game stream on Tuesday. We're probably going to do a Sim City game stream on Wednesday before the podcast because I'm really excited to play that and I didn't get a chance to play in any of the betas actually. Um, so I am looking forward to doing that. Uh, and I'm also going to hopefully have posted not using the different not using necessarily the new frame rating stuff but a look at titan three-way sli performance and then uh, a bunch of triple monitor performance testing for all the high-end cards as well very cool we've got we've got some excitement going on with some high-end audio gear i'm working on a hundred dollar audio file system you can order off of amazon and have shipped to your home for free uh see what that actually sounds like in the real world versus in theory and of course we'll be doing viewer questions as always that's about it for this edition of twitch this week in computer hardware if you enjoyed the show if you're new to the show do us a favor head over to twit.tv slash twitch you can find all our overload all of our older episodes, assuming I don't pass out and we don't have another one, all of our older episodes and information on how to subscribe so it automatically shows up in your favorite podcatcher. And uh, that's about it for this edition of the show. I'm Patrick Gordon. I'm Ryan Shroud. We'll see you next week on Twitch. <laughs>